Good morning, I'm Jerry McCartney, Purdue University CIO and the director of the Dawn or Doom Conference, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's opening event for this year's Dawn or Doom. This is our third year, and we're very excited about what the event has become. Purdue is a global leader in many areas of technology, and we think it's important to have these types of discussions that we're going to be having over the next couple of days about what happens with these technologies when they move from our labs into the real world. We're pleased to have a great group of journalists join us this morning, uh, so you can hear about the industry that keeps us all informed about what is going on in science and technology. I also want to welcome C-SPAN, who is here today recording this and other sessions for broadcast later this year. So let me take a minute to introduce our panelists. I'm pleased to introduce Natalie de Blasio. Natalie is the digital editor at USA Today, where she manages the publication's social media strategy on the West Coast, reports on technology and breaking news, and writes a column called Launched. I don't want to say hash launched, I guess, right? Hashtag yep, launched. Focused on the intersection of tech and culture in the Bay Area. As a reporter, she's covered everything from protests at political conventions to tragedies including the Aurora Theater Massacre, Superstorm Sandy, and the Boston Marathon bombings. Natalie will be leaving the conference early tomorrow to head to the vice presidential debate, so she has a busy week. Next, I'm delighted to introduce Jared Council. Jared joined the Indianapolis Business Journal in September 14, and he covers technology and finance. Before joining the IBJ, he worked as a reporter on jobs in southern Indiana and coastal Virginia, covering beats including crime, city government, and defense contracting. He's won statewide journalism awards in Virginia and Indiana for both investigative reporting and technology reporting. Emily Dreyfus is Wired's news and opinion editor. She leads Wired's new national affairs coverage focusing on social upheavals that will shape the future of America. Before landing at Wired, her previous endeavors, including acting as the managing editor of CNET social media and homepage, as well as executive producing CNET TV's Rumor Has It. Emily will also be speaking a second time today right here in Fowler Hall at about 3.30 about her experiences working in the San Francisco offices of Wired as a telepresence robot. Yes. <laughs> and finally, but certainly not leastly, Quinton Hardy, who is the deputy technology editor for the New York Times and formerly executive editor for Forbes Media. Hardy began his career at the Wall Street Journal and has written cover stories on diverse topics such as the internet, Africa, <laughs> finance, enterprise hardware and software, management, satellite, energy, and the marijuana industry. Congratulations. Which accounts for my ADD. <laughs> Hardy began his career as an international publisher and has lived and worked in a dozen countries, including Japan, Singapore, and the United Kingdom. Finally, Katie Steinmetz, Time Magazine's bureau chief in San Francisco, was not able to be here today. She is, however, still going to be one of the finalist judges for the student writing contest, and we hope J uh, Katie can join us next year. Our moderator today is the uh, widely known Steve Talley. Steve is an author of two books, a former columnist for Men's Fitness Magazine and a former magazine editor at 1330 Esquire. He is now our senior strategist for STEM in public affairs. Now, please silent your devices, but don't put them away. We hope to see you tweeting to the hashtag Dawn or Doom, or posting to Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, or whatever local poison you prefer. <laughs> and please join me in welcoming our journalists. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks to everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to start off with what I hope is a very easy question. Uh, so starting with Jared, uh, could you tell us a little bit about where you went to school and just a bit about your current job? What, what do you do? OK. Um, yeah, so uh, 28 years old, born in Philly, uh, went to Hampton University, in, uh, which is not far from Virginia Beach and uh, graduated in 2010 and 
so I've been in journalism for about six years now, and I think I've been a geek for about 28 years. <laughs> um, and I just love learning about stuff, and you know, I kind of got introduced to journalism as, hey, here's a way to learn about stuff and, and uh, tell others about what you learn and get paid for it all. So that's kind of what attracted me. Um, and uh, like I said, I graduated in 2010, worked in southern Indiana, my first job out of college, uh, covered uh, crime and, and uh, government there, and then moved to Virginia in 2012. Uh, and covered defense contracting, tourism, so on and so forth. And uh, two years after that, finally moved to Indianapolis, and it was my first uh, time covering anything related to technology. I don't have any background in tech, didn't get a degree in tech, uh, but you know, knew how to talk to people and, and tell stories, and um, was just really attracted to the field uh, because of you know, the, the promise and the pearls, as you know, this whole conference is about. Um, these days, I cover, I kind of look at it in uh, two ways. I, I cover not only the, the uh, uh, I guess, technology business, so software that businesses use to, to run their businesses better, whether it's marketing or procurement. Um, so I cover all of that, but also the business of technology uh, in terms of how do you start a tech company, how do you uh, raise money for it, and um, you know, ultimately, how do you how do you uh, chart a path to a successful exit? Um, so that's what I do. Yeah, Natalie. Hi, I'm Natalie De Blasio with USA Today. I have moved to San Francisco to work with our technology team in December. Before that, I was in charge of a fitness publication in Virginia that was online only, and then before that, I was with USA Today for about three and a half years as a breaking news reporter. Um, I went to college at the University of Vermont in Burlington, which is beautiful, everyone should go. <laughs> and um, my job now, okay, so I work in a bureau of USA Today, which has significantly fewer people than our headquarters. Um, and I write about tech, and I also write about breaking news and help manage our paper's social media strategy, but also work with the tech reporters and our West Coast reporters to make sure that we're um, optimizing everybody's social media presence and helping everyone kind of elevate themselves on as many platforms as we can. All right, thanks. Emily? Hi, I'm Emily Dreyfus with Wired Magazine. Um, I went to Wesleyan University in Connecticut and I was an English major and I stumbled into journalism because I had no idea what somebody whose only skill was writing would do after college. <laughs> um, and it suddenly occurred to me that journalists get paid to write words. So I became a reporter. <laughs> that used to be true. <laughs> yes. Well, I got paid very little, to be frank. Um, my first job was as a reporter at a tiny newspaper on the coast of Connecticut, and I was the only staff writer on the paper. I had zero experience, but that didn't matter. I wrote about crime, which we actually did have some. There was I, I had to cover a standoff in the street, um, but I also covered the building of the new skate park, and I was the restaurant reviewer and the playhouse reviewer. <laughs> um, I did a little bit of everything, and from there I just fell in love with, with the craft of journalism, um, and I became an editor. I moved out to San Francisco as well, and that's how I found my way into technology journalism because uh, you know, San Francisco is where tech is everywhere. And I was not, I didn't identify as a geek. Uh, I actually kind of thought to myself, I'm gonna get out of this, I'm gonna go back to the literary arts. <laughs> um, but I quickly realized that technology is everywhere and is inescapable. And I sort of bring the perspective of the reluctant technologist to my coverage of the tech world, because I think whether you're super into it and you're a gadget hound or not, uh, technology is, is happening to you. And so that's sort of the perspective I like to take on all the coverage. Um, and now at Wired, I am trying to take that perspective in how technology hits every aspect of our lives and society, um, and particularly right now looking at the presidential election. Thanks, and Quentin? Hi, I um, definitely went to a couple of colleges and have some degrees, but I think there's a couple other things that are sort of more interesting where my work is concerned. One is I'm third generation on both sides of my family in journalism, cartoonists and writers and wow. business people. Nice. So watching what's happening now is of interest. 
And the other is I spent 13 years overseas. I started out as a traveling salesman, and then I was a correspondent in Tokyo <laughs> back in the days when we were worried that American high school students weren't learning enough Japanese. That'll give you some perspective. <laughs> And so in some sense, I'm back in the United States, something like a foreign correspondent. And that's a really appropriate stance to take in the kind of thing I'm covering now. Because Emily just said something really important. Technology is now shot through everywhere. The internet used to be a place. Now, essentially, the internet pervades all of society, all of the physical world, the way we think about things in some ways has the tropes of the internet in very important ways. What I like to do is try and look at that as a breaking phenomenon, but even more uh, is to go to non-obvious places where it's taking hold and try and, by using that off-center approach, shifting people's views about things. A couple of years ago, I was north of here writing about a uh, family farm in Indiana that had to become so data smart, or I went to North Dakota and wrote about the drone industry outside of Grand Forks, or I went down to Texas and wrote about what it's like to be a high school football coach in an age where everything is being videoed all the time. Hmm. And you're, you're getting all these instant messages from people with 30 second shots of their kid doing a tackle. And you know, it's, a, it's an entirely different dynamic. So that's what I do. All right, thank you, Quentin. Uh, and I'm gonna come right back to you. So, so what uh, do you like most about your job? What, what motivates you to go back into the office every day? Aside from the golf umbrella. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm glad no, you had I that. like, um, no, I mean, you know, I get paid to go to school, right? It's fantastic. I, I get up in the morning and I think, what's the coolest thing I can think about today and who can I talk to about it? And people still pick up the phone when the press calls. They're really welcoming. They want to explain themselves. They want to be understood. It's a tremendous honor and a responsibility to try and present that fairly. It's just a blast. Yeah. That sounds great. And Emily, even if you're going into the office as a robot, <laughs> uh, what, what mo motivates you to go in? Yeah, I, I think that um, just the fact that all I have to do all day is think. I just get to think and be curious about things. And I, I read the news. I wake up in the morning and I read the New York Times. I read USA Today. I read local newspapers. And then I think, you know, what do I have to say about that? And what can we contribute? And where else can we look? And what more is there to say? And that's just so fun. Natalie? Yeah, I um, have a lot of questions all the time. And like when I'm with my friends in social situations, they sometimes have to be like, stop interrogating the Uber driver <laughs> about like whatever I'm interested in. So when I get to work, I'm like allowed to kind of indulge Freedom. my never ending questioning self. Um, and I think the same thing, just that every day I get to go in and learn something new. And the cool thing about journalism is you go you go to work every day and you're honing this storytelling skill, no matter what platform you're telling the story on. Mm -hmm. But every day is totally different because the news is totally different. Um, so it's the perfect amount of you know, working towards something and working towards something completely different every day. Thanks. And Jared? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with, with uh, all of that. Um, but I think more specifically, you know, I, I, I like where I'm at uh, in journalism. Um, in, in terms of being able to cover the technology industry in central Indiana. Uh, for decades, I'm sure as many of you uh, know, uh, the, the tech scene here in terms of startups and, and, and financing, um, it's, it's really been a desert out here. And uh, you know, back in the late 18, I'm sorry, 1980s, uh, it started to change a little bit with folks like Bob Compton um, and, and Don Brown of Interactive Intelligence really kind of planting the seeds um, for this ecosystem to grow. And uh, today, uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm on the, the front end of a, of a growth story um, with technology here in central Indiana. Uh, you know, Angie's List is a household name in a publicly traded company. Uh, Interactive Intelligence, while it's not so much a household name, you know, they just had a $1.4 billion exit uh, a month or two ago. Um, and the biggest story uh, is, is uh, Exact Target. Um, which started out as a, a, a digital marketing company aimed at laundromats um, to now, or I'm sorry, a few years ago, uh, selling to Salesforce for $2.5 billion. And you know, we're still seeing the ripple effects of, of all of that in terms of folks going out and becoming investors or starting their own companies or just lending their skills to startups. Um, so you know, I'm, I, I appreciate being able to sort of be the scribe to cover all of that as it's happening. 
Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of exciting things happening here in central Indiana, although we kind of put our own spin on it. A lot, uh, a lot of ag tech, for example, is, is going on. Uh, so this is for anyone. Uh, is there anything about your job that surprises you uh, or has surprised you when you went to your current position? So anyone just jump in. I've got some. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot of things that surprise me. I think the first thing is how very different our audiences are depending on what platform we're reaching them on. Um, people that find us today on Snapchat are consuming news completely differently and are not also consuming news on their mobile app. Same thing for tablet app users or mobile web, Facebook, um, people that are reading us. And no matter where they're reading us, they're reading us for a different reason. Um, and also, when it comes to understanding the content, people are all over the map as far as if they're really, really already interested in something or if they're totally new to a topic. So we're finding that we're doing, like when, um, for example, when the FBI wanted to get into the iPhone after the San Bernardino shooting, we wrote a news story about how that happened and then we wrote an explainer about why it would even matter that that breaking into a phone might have consequences down the road. And then we needed to write a different type of explainer. And then we needed to write a story about how people were reacting to it. And the reason is because there's a lot to talk about, but also because people understand completely different things about a topic. And because we have such a broad audience, um, I was surprised to realize how many different ways we need to write and frame things to reach everyone where they're at on the platforms that they're at. That's interesting. I didn't, I didn't expect that. So, uh, Quentin, the New York Times has obviously seen an enormous amount of change and, and is, is a leader in uh, changing journalism. So how might you answer that? What sort of surprises you? Oh, what surprises me? What surprises me would be the um, appetite the readers have for difficult subjects, they always have, but it used to be Chinese foreign policy or it was very politically driven. And people are extremely hungry to know more about what tech is doing. It's transforming everything in the world. So they're willing to go very deep and learn things to a, with much more depth than you would expect. And then I think your question is also about the times itself and what's surprising in that. Um, well, the amount of video, the, um, we get just fantastic designers, the experiments in animation, which I think is extremely powerful, um, the, um, the way we're having different sorts of relationships with the reader, much more direct, where you know, various newsletters and email reminders and whatever become extremely important in having this kind of bilateral relationship. There's a feature called What We're Reading, where various reporters will pick out things elsewhere on the web. And people are interested in that. They want to know sort of, you know, what else am I looking at? Mm -hmm. and this is a very popular item. So what that's telling you is, you know, it's really nice to, you know, people value my opinion or whatever. But they're also developing this relationship with the reporter at the paper, where it used to be a relationship with the paper generally. And we're going to see where that goes. Yeah, that is interesting. And, and uh, I know a lot of uh, outlets encourage people to have their own Twitter presence and their own social media presence. And Within that's reason. <laughs> hey, I Steve. can fill that in offline if you all want. <laughs> hey, Steve, got those something? In? Yeah, please um, do. I don't know if this is really a surprise, but it, it never ceases to astonish me. And, you know, and, and that's the lack of diversity in yeah. this field. Um, you know, I'm the first black reporter at my paper, which was started in 1980. Um, and rarely do I encounter folks of color covering a beat or in positions like me, um, you know, covering this industry. And um, so, Jared, why do you think that is? Um, well, well <laughs> I don't know. There's probably a whole a whole host of reasons. Um, you know, I, I think I mean, we're, you know, just take blacks, for example, we're 13% we're, we're of the country, but when you look at uh, diversity surveys from Google and Facebook, I mean, we make up two, 3% of that at some of these companies. And, um, and it's not, I mean, I, I wouldn't put all minorities there because we see, I think, a proportionate number of Asians or Indians. Um, but with blacks and Hispanics, it's just, 
you know, we're largely missing. And, you know, in, in terms of the reasons, like I said, we could kind of have a whole, a whole panel discussion on that. But I think one, one reason might be uh, wealth. Um, and when you look at African American wealth, it's just a slice of, you know, what Caucasian wealth is in this country. And I mean, that matters when yeah. you're, you have an idea to start a company, but you don't have any friends or family to turn to to write that first seed check. Um, you know, and uh, you know it matters when y y you uh, you want to pursue an idea, but you don't have the luxury to take off work or or quit your job. So, um, you know, I think that's that's one reason. And then, uh, you know, why that is, <laughs> not not exactly sure. But I think I think the way we can kind of turn the the tide, or at least you know, begin to. And I'm sure there are I mean there are tons of efforts already underway. Um, but and I, I think. People, people want to be what they see. So, you know, if we have more minorities in executive positions, you know, Tristan Walker is one person that comes to mind. He runs a, a Bevel, uh, the shaving company. Um, you know, people, it actually gives somebody something to emulate. Um, you know, I, I think by and large, color shouldn't matter, but it does. And, you know, if you don't have uh, folks in an industry, um, Again, that can serve as examples and for for folk, for people to aspire to be. I mean, it's a tough it's a tough sell. So yeah, I I, uh, I think you're right. I appreciate you bringing that up, and and you're right. We should have a panel on that, and maybe next year at Donner Doom we will. So yeah. Yeah. can uh, I dovetail off of oh, please uh, what you were yeah. saying really quickly? Because I think it's a really important point, and it and it's not just um, a problem in the industries we cover, but it's a really big problem in journalism itself. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you're really right to bring up the the barrier and the cost of entry. And journalism is like that too. You know, our industry is really dependent on unpaid internships yep. as a way in. Mm -hmm. And in order to be able to afford to take an unpaid internship, you need to have the family support and the institutional support behind you to, to not make money for three months. Or in my case, you know, my first writing gig that I was mentioning in Connecticut, that started as an unpaid internship after college. And, and then it turned into a staff writing position where I got paid money. And, um, and that, I think, really contributes to a lack of diversity in, as, an, as a barrier to entry into the field. And then, I mean, we can, there's a million problems um, that, that, that percolate up and result in a whiteness in journalism. But another thing is the segregation of our networks and how we find people to work with. And because there is this whiteness at the very beginning, then the other people that you have worked with maybe are not a person of color, and so then when you're thinking of hiring someone for a job, you reach out to your own network. And you know we are a diverse country, but we're a segregated country for a multitude of reasons. And people, whether they intend to or not, with you know absolutely benign neglect, uh, reach out to those that they know. And we know people who are like us, and therefore we we insulate ourselves. Um, and it's a really big problem. You know we we also in journalism have this thing where we want to cover all topics but if you look at any of our organizations you know we cover the topics that as we said are interested are interesting to us um, and, and when we wake up in the morning and we're like, what is the thing that I want to talk about today? This is why it's vitally important that we have different types of people in the newsroom asking mm -hmm. those questions. Because what's interesting to me and what's interesting to Quentin is going to be very different than what's interesting to somebody else. Um, and you know, we're grappling with this at Wired. It's, it's a real problem. And we desperately need other voices in our newsroom. Um, and I, I have no idea what the solution is, other than to just say, if, if you're a non-white man wanting to go into journalism, please do. Please. <laughs> there you <laughs> go, <it>. Jared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a very important topic, and uh, we will be go, uh, returning to that. You're right, that yeah. deserves more attention. Um, so uh, I think everyone here except for Emily who works at a tech publication sort of has the beat of tech and I guess Emily you're, that's your publication uh, but okay. Uh, that's fair okay uh, <laughs> uh, but as we read the news these days it seems that tech is everywhere so in politics you have these stories about email servers uh, and and cybersecurity uh, so many business stories are about some new tech development is there still a tech beat, or are all reporters tech reporters now? I think because so much conversation happens on social media, 
and we're considering social media tech still. And we've talked about that kind of in our newsroom a little bit about you know what is like new technology and are these companies, these social communication platforms, tech? Mm -hmm. And yeah, we've decided that they are. And uh, right now in the evenings, the day of politics will happen, and then the night of Twitter and Facebook mm -hmm. and like Reddit commentary descends on. Earth, <laughs> and then what the night stories end up being is just what people are talking about. And yeah. um, in addition stories. to the night story, well, what it, what it kind of what happens is you know the news happens, and then people talk about it, and we yeah. do on the street interviews, but also the big conversations. People, strangers are arguing with each other like fiercely on social media, and that is what's happening. It's almost like we need to cover conversation socially as like a metro beat, you know? Yeah. Like what's everyone saying in New York City? What's everyone saying in the Twitterverse? Um, so in that way, there's always a, there's always a tech-infused social feedback piece. I think a social media metro desk would be fascinating, yeah. <laughs> a, me a metro area, yeah. Uh, well, so Quentin, just, uh, yeah. Uh, let, let me spend a sec on that. You know, I think in a world where um, 90 Eight percent, I think, of Wall Street trading is computer-driven, or where the president is putting less money into an aircraft carrier and more money into the CIA and the NSA, or where agriculture is about, you know, involves genetic modifications of crops. Yeah, everything's a tech story, and every reporter thinks they're a tech reporter, <laughs> which is just fantastic for people like me and Natalie who spend our you know lives sweating bullets to get this stuff right. Right. But <laughs> there, you know, we and Jared too. You know, like everybody thinks you know I got that one, and you're like, no, you don't. And you read it's like, I really wish you'd talk to me about that, you know. But that's just family stuff, and we'll talk about that. There is still tech reporting though, which is spotting that crossover of science and engineering into commerce, you know, and, and that fuzzy area where things are being developed and invented and they're hopeful but they haven't attached to the world or they're attaching to the world in some novel way. They're not baked in yet. And that's a very rich patch right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, to, to work in tech journalism, to be a tech editor or tech reporter, do you need a background in engineering computer science or or is it more about the reporting? Well, I think it depends on what uh, part of tech you're doing. Um, you know, for me, I don't have a background in it. And I am a tech editor. I assign stories and, and I write um, stories on cybersecurity and um, robotics in the future of work. And I learned on the job. You know, I definitely need to have technical skills because I, but, but I honed them at CNET and at Wired. But I do think, some of the best reporters we have, let's say, in cybersecurity, which is a very complicated topic, and in order to explain you know, an air-gapped hack of a computer, you really need to know a lot about engineering and how things work. Um, one of our reporters does have a technical background and the other one doesn't, but uh, they're equally adept in the conversation, and that's because as a reporter, you have access to talking to all the experts. So as long as you know which questions to ask and you can you can learn, you're good at learning. Um, I don't think you do need to, but it, it depends. If it's very, very technical, I think it would probably be very helpful. I think having a variety of reporters with a variety of different backgrounds really helps too, because so I have this yeah. column and what it's about is that I just moved to the Bay Area and I'm a millennial and like every millennial want, that is interested in tech wants to move to the Bay Area and it's expensive and it's ridiculous and when you're there, it's like being in a different, world because everyone talks about and values and understands these things that it, that don't matter everywhere else or <laughs> aren't happening yet. So my stories are coming at it from that lens. It's like an outsider's view of an insider's place where everything is like kind of in Latin in this weird new tech way. Um, but that being said, we've got like our cybersecurity reporter is brilliant and she's great. And when I was tasked with helping with a story, I didn't even realize what I didn't know. Right. So having her around to kind of to bounce ideas off of or to handle some of it is, right. is was wonderful. And so I do think it, it helps to have all of it because our readers are looking for all different kinds of understanding of technology. Mm -hmm. So uh, my next question may be a little bit of, of inside baseball, but uh, 
uh, science writing and medical writing are recognized as, as specialty fields within journalism, and they have their own conventions, and there's things like in, in medical writing, the Engel Finger Rule on, on when you can write about uh, studies. Uh, there is a National Association of Science Writers, there is a Medical Writers Association. As far as I know, there's no Technology Writers Association, National Association. Is, is technology writing... Uh, By a, technology, a, you mean computers, basically, right? Because it's such a broad term. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm, sort of what I'm asking. Is, is technology so broad that, that there is not a specialty field of technology writing? Do you think there will be? Or do you think as technology uh, continues to spread that, as uh, we were saying earlier, that perhaps every writer will be a technology writer? So, so do, you think, do you think it will become its own specialty? I think it used to be its own specialty, yeah. and it isn't anymore. Um, you know, back 20 years ago when CNET was first started and Wired was first started, it was very much a niche thing that was focused on uh, gadgets and, and computers and how we were going to shrink down chips and, and what the internet was going to do. And now, as Clinton said earlier, I mean, those, that is a pervasive part of all of life. And you know, at Wired, people are constantly referring to Wired as a technology magazine, um, though that's not really how we see ourselves anymore, only because we see technology as so much a part of society that we think we're kind of covering a little bit of everything. And you know, we have an entertainment desk and a national affairs desk and a science desk and science writing, and, and which is a very intense specialty because it's so hard to understand what you know, PhDs are publishing in science and nature journals that you really need a specialized person to be able to interpret it. But we, we have that all under the umbrella of what I think you might consider tech writing. Yeah, there's, there's some people in the audience right now. They're looking at their phones, these high-end consumer products that were <laughs> manufactured in China by cheap laborers. They're checking social media. So they're going to these organizations, some of which are inside Amazon Web Services, these enormous cloud computing systems, and they're using that computing to map social relationships using artificial intelligence. So there's like five different tech stories just in somebody sitting right there looking at their phone. You know, it's it's kind of big. What can I? You know, where do I stop? Uh, so, <laughs> no, I, I didn't mean to call I you out. Looking at you, we, we encourage you all to be posting on social media about this panel. We, know, we like it, basically. It, I haven't checked my Twitter in 20 minutes now, and it's kind of making me nervous. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a real change for events like this where it used to be if people were on their phones, you thought you were failing, and now if they're not on their phones, you know something's going wrong because yeah. uh, they're, not, they're not posting anything. Uh, there are so many product developments and, and uh, uh, company announcements in technology. Uh, I, I honestly don't know how y'all keep up. Uh, but it, it does make me wonder, so with all, with all this daily churn, uh, do you think there are technology stories that you're missing or you would like, you wish you had more time to spend covering? Yeah. yeah. Are you asking me if I'm paranoid? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, Way I'm just- paranoid. Uh, <laughs> There's, I think um, there's so much happening, so many people developing so many cool things, and so many people that um, are trying to get people. So because Facebook was successful, everyone that is in the startup world like dreams of being the next Facebook. So as soon as they have an idea that resonates with anyone, they are running with it. And I mean, I probably get like which takes us to therapy. 300 well, pitches a day <laughs> from startups. And Hampton Creek. Yeah. Goodness. Well, they're plausible. At least it was a product. True. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we were getting inside. But that's, that's actually the hazard. Like, you can get so far into hoping it's going to be the next thing. It's called falling in love with your source, you know? It's like, oh, this has got to be true. This guy is so great. I love this thing, you know? And Theranos is kind of an example of falling in love with your source and hoping you've spotted the next best thing. I, I almost wanted to know uh, what I'm talking about. Take bets on how at yeah. what point Theranos would be mentioned in this panel. Yeah. Multi billion dollar whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it was a company that that a lot of uh, the coverage uh, 
took a different direction in the spring and, and uh, exposed When everything policy. turned out to be fake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and I mean, the thing with Theranos, actually, though, is that it's a great idea. If it would work, everyone would want it to be true because puppies if you... Puppies that sweat vodka is a good idea. <laughs> well, <too. laughs> exactly, well, exactly, so but... Okay, but, hashtag puppies that sweat vodka. <laughs> but I think as... As Nally was saying, so um, like Silicon Valley is promising to make the world a better place. You know, that's the narrative that is being sold to us. And as tech journalists, one of the things we have to be on guard for, as I think Quentin is mentioning, is people who are selling a false promise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's sort of easy sometimes to see it because places will oversell something that is so absurdly banal that you would never give them the credit that they want. Well, they'll, they'll say like, it, it's almost like that 30 Rock ad where um, they were like, do you ever have trouble putting bread in the toaster? And, <laughs> and no, no one has ever had that problem. Um, and Silicon Valley is often trying to solve problems that don't exist just to make your life more convenient. But Theranos was actually a blood technology company that was saying there, there is a high cost of entry to getting medical tests done. And if, you could, if we could make this easier, and we should be able to, because science has all of these abilities now, and if you could do it at home, and if we could make it fast and, and, and streamline it, then that would be great. And, and we, as journalists, a lot of us, I mean, maybe not particularly on the stage, but our colleagues and, and, and our whole industry was like, that's a great idea. Um, and we let them tell it. So Jared, I'm going right. to come to right. you Jared with the next yeah. question, but I'm not picking on you. I'm not trying to imply anything. But do you think tech journalists, uh, and again, because of the speed of news, do you think uh, tech journalists sometimes end up uh, uh, erring on the side of being cheerleaders for industry? Well, uh, two, two things. Uh, first, I would say is um, I think sometimes we, uh, in, the, in the media business at large, but especially in technology, we have short attention spans mm -hmm. and you know we'll, we'll we'll cover something because it's you know what's new and what's next and it's and it's hot and then you know we won't really follow it through uh you know i think one example of that and you know, no offense to anybody here but uh you know with when 3d printing was 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 hot a few years ago right. um it was just kind of like the wave and hey this is going to change lives dramatically here in the next few years and we haven't really seen that um and i think uh, you know for the most part a lot of these these technologies um, they take time to, to gain traction and, um, you know, they can be the best idea in the world, but if the moment isn't right, then the moment isn't right. I mean, look at virtual reality technology in the 90s, um, you know, kind of the window wasn't open yet. And um, I think sometimes, you know, we can just, again, kind of focus all this attention and say, hey, hey, yeah, this is the next big thing, um, when it really has yet to prove it itself out. So. Um, as far as being cheerleaders, like I think that, you know, sometimes the stories that we're telling aren't really that sexy, so we have to spice it up and, and get people's attention. Um, and, you know, whether it's self driving cars or, or drones or whatever. Um, and I don't think we're being cheerleaders by doing that as long as we can talk about the reality and the, uh, the hurdles you know, that are present for whatever the technology is. Just to uh, fill out, uh, go ahead, Natalie. Well, I was just gonna say that I think that even without trying to be a cheerleader, just writing about a company in a way that isn't immediately like condemning it mm -hmm. is cheerleading it in a way because mm -hmm. there are so many companies and everyone is just fighting to get noticed. And if your name is in a headline, and the way that social media is working right now is people aren't even necessarily reading the story. They're just seeing the headline. And then if your company is named, mm -hmm. then you're higher in search results. And then you're going to be, your Facebook page is going to get more views. And um, so I think that just by getting a lot of pitches and writing about the ones that might be interesting, by picking one and not the other, we're giving that company a giant leg up over its competitors. Yeah. And in that way, it's not cheerleading, but it is like, I mean, just a properly timed, interesting enough startup, startup following in your lap can really change the game for that startup. Well, and I think like uh, Emily- Just to follow, yeah. follow through on what Jared was saying, there's this really interesting kind of counter dynamic that journalists fall into a lot. Um, shortly after dinosaurs ruled the earth, I was at the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this guy, Don Valentine, came in. He's a big VC in those days. And he said, you guys, Every one of you, you know, you find something and it becomes big and you hype it up and then it crashes 
and you all laugh at it. How could it be so stupid? <laughs> and then you miss the part where it just kind of finds its way back and stitches itself into society and is like really important. And I've kind of taken that to heart. I'm guilty of it for sure. But it's like, you know, now Theranos is on its knees, but somebody's gonna probably figure out spotting proteins for yeah. disease tracking. And at that point we'll be exhausted and we'll go, oh yeah, uh, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and not recognize that mm. Something okay. akin to magic has just occurred in the world, you know? <laughs> well, and I, I think, as Emily said, uh, these are things that uh, are at least attempting to solve problems in our society, problems that, that we have globally, and, and uh, we want to see progress. And, and I think a lot of us uh, are on Team Dawn. You know, we're, we're, we want to see human progress, and, and that's that... Uh, mm -hmm. I think sort of comes out sometimes in our writing. We want to see big progress or like big changes and no one is excited about like clicking a headline that's like, we are taking a substantial step forward in the right direction on like yeah. this front kind of, we think. Right. Yeah. And so that's not what, and that's just what you're saying. The kind of incremental improvements that and then we're, I was mentioning. We're, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, but that's also true of the people who we depend on to write right. the stories. People don't want to tell a process story. You know, I, I'm constantly saying to scientists, I want to hear the story about the, all the failures that went into you coming to this mm -hmm. discovery. Um, because they will publish a paper that took them 10 years to get to this result. And, and it's, I find it fascinating to hear of all the ups and downs and disappointments and the time that they thought that the cells were gonna give them the data they wanted and then they didn't. But, but individuals, researchers, and companies in particular don't wanna talk about that because that's quote unquote bad press. I once covered a guy who, who was building a repository of failures so that other scientists could see, well, that's what didn't work yes. and I'm trying this thing. And like there was this social network of people's like, I'm gonna try this. Anybody else ever tried it? And they go, yeah, I failed. This guy in Spain did it. Like, forget it, it doesn't oh, go. Cool. It's that a brilliant would be so idea. helpful, yeah. yeah. But uh, it just, the other thing is we're kind of covering delusional people <laughs> because <laughs> you have to yeah. be. Otherwise, if you really knew the odds on like what a startup is and how often they fail, you wouldn't get out of bed, you know? And you, the technology they're making has been so transformative that they see shaping the world. They don't just see building a product, you know? Elon Musk gets up last week oh my goodness. and says, here's how I'm going to colonize Mars. <laughs> and everybody's like, okay, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he might just be the lunatic to do it. No, he's the far end of a true thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so hashtag delusional tech people. Uh, and then uh, I, I apologize, we're running a little bit short on time for questions, but we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, there's a mic up here if anybody has a question for the panelists. And since this is being uh, recorded, if you would ask your questions at the microphone, we'd appreciate it. Appreciate all of you being here. Now, we've got a, a variety of panelist here, two editors, two reporters, and I think Emily mentioned waking up in the morning and wondering, what am I going to cover today? Hmm. For the reporters, how do you decide what to cover? And for the editors, how do you assign and how has that changed over the last few years? Oh, okay, well, I'll start. Um, as, so I am the morning news editor at Wired as well as the national affairs editor. So, you know, there's always kind of two different timelines. There's one of the stories that we've been that we're working on on a longer time scale, so that we've assigned them. The reporters are working on them for weeks or months, um, and depending on how much research they need to do. And that's something I have in the back of my mind, knowing you know when are those going to come in. But in terms of morning assignments and looking at uh, how I decide what other people need to be talking about, um, you know, social media has really changed this equation for me, and Twitter has become a resource that I rely on almost assuredly too much for this moment um, because there's, there are two different rubrics. One is, are other, is it important enough that people are already talking about it and it's something that is out there that we need to weigh in on because it's this moment that's happening? Or there's the thing that no one else has discovered yet and we need to be the first to bring it to their attention. Um, so I look at social media sort of for the former and to discover the latter, I, I either depend upon my beat reporters who will bring me pitches, or I have my you know, proprietary secret 
places of the internet and world that I am looking that I would never let anyone see all the tabs that I have because that's my secret way into trying to get us scoops. Um, so that's, that's me. I, I'd agree with, I, I like the way you frame that. Um, I think for me it's a little different um, because I'm not a national reporter. I'm focused you know, solely on, on central Indiana. Um, and a lot of times, you know, there's already stories out there that, that, that you know, PR folks are, are pushing and that companies are, are trying to sell, whether it's a, a fundraise or a new hire. And, you know, that's the stuff that everybody has. And if it is important enough, we are going to go after it and, you know, quote unquote, weigh in. But uh, we really pride ourselves on trying to find those distinctive stories that, that nobody is telling. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. It might have been a month or so ago uh, now. Um, Geophedia, which is this hot tech company based out of Chicago, they opened up a uh, office here in Indianapolis last year and said they wanted to hire 300 people here by, I want to say 2018, but you can fact check me on that. Um, and last month, I got a, a text from a source saying, hey, did you hear about what's going on with Geophedia? Uh, and you know, come to find out they were laying people off. And it's like, okay, if this company just signed a deal with the state to hire this many people and get this much in tax credits, uh, and now they're laying people off, like this is, this is a big deal. So uh, I started calling, and that source was, was uh, largely unreachable. He was at some conference and couldn't talk, but I started calling folks that used to work at Geophedia, you know, by looking at their LinkedIn pages and folks that I knew there and finally, Finally got uh, got the story, and when I when I talked to the um, the CEO of it all, uh, this is obviously a story that they're not going to want to push. You know, they're going to want to make these layoffs and, and keep it moving. Um, but when I talked to him, he was like, "How did how did you find out about this so quickly? Like, I just told the employees, and you know, I, I got to give credit to my sources for that one. But I mean, those are the types of stories that I think to kind of go back to what you were saying earlier about cheerleading. Um, you know, we need, to, we, we need to cover the good stories. We need to cover the companies that are hot and that do have a lot of promise. But we also need to, um, you know, chronicle the ones that are struggling or that fail, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to really make sure that we're getting both sides of it. All right. Thanks, Jared. Uh, we, we'll make the, one more question and we'll make it quick. Yeah. Thank you so much for attending. So my question is really on, you know, sometimes when you look at tech news, it's kind of like chasing cool, what everything is cool right there. As a bystander, you know, from Lafayette, Indiana, who have no involvement in terms of what Uber is doing, do you think tech reporters also have responsibility when there is new technology coming out in terms of diffusing it, that it makes sense for people in the, you know, somewhere in Indiana, like for example, like Instagram or Snapchat, but they, when they come up with new features, we just say, hey, there's Snapchat comes up with. It's really like the new, what call it, the... Filter. Yeah. No, the, the, the glass, glass. Oh, yeah, the yeah, snap. Yeah, oh, for snap. example. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're speaking to a 35-year-old male, he's probably like, well, what do we should, why should I care about that? So is that also imposed upon you as a reporter to kind of diffuse it? Because sometimes when I read tech news, it's like everything that is new, but less so in terms of, well, how do I make sense about the technology? And I think that that's a great question. I think it sort of gets to... Uh, now to what you were saying earlier about now you have all these different audiences. Yeah, people are, people, so the Snapchat news comes out and then so we have the chunk of the population that uses Snapchat, can't wait for the features to come out and they're updated on the latest ones and before even seeing it, probably understand how they're gonna use it. Then we have people that really need a news story that says like, this is exactly how your physical app is going to change and what you're going to need to touch instead to see new things. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna need to tell someone like, okay guys, there's this thing called Snapchat and people are on it <laughs> and they're talking to each other. And, and But all three are very, very valid storytelling the means that need to happen because mm. the people that are learning that even the people that don't understand how Snapchat works are missing out on the fact that there is a segment of the population that is communicating with disappearing messages and the impact that that's going to have down the line is going to be important. So it is really important that we try to figure out how to break down the story for all of these, yeah. I, mean, I guess the answer is yep, that's super important and we're definitely <laughs> trying to do it all the time. Yes. <laughs> all right, uh, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Would you join me in thanking our panelists as well as our graphic artists? Thank you all.